This morning, Gay Street United Methodist Church family, friends, people who might just have connected to our website and decided this is something they want to do this week. Whether you are worshiping at home with others, alone, whether you are near or far, in some way connected, I welcome you this morning to our worship service and also to welcome you as as a, an opportunity to do something special for Mother's Day today as well. So welcome all of our mothers that are here. We are still in the Easter season, alleluia, so I greet you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This month of May, we are focusing on a theme that is the church is the people. This comes from the old song about I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together, and it says the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. And we found that the scriptures for this month all were directed especially to the early Christians, to those first century and second century Christians, which were trying to, who were trying to figure out who are we as Christians? What does this mean to be followers of Jesus after the resurrection, after Jesus was no longer with them, after they were no longer in Jerusalem? And they're trying to figure out how do we live together as a people? How do we follow Christ? How do we live in God and with each other? And how, are, how do we be the church? And isn't that appropriate for where we are today, where we're not in a building, not underneath the steeple, not maybe just taking for granted everything that we used to do as a church, to think about who are we as the people? And so this is a unique opportunity this month to look at these scriptures in this time where they had no roadmaps, and neither do we, for who we are and where we're going. Last week, we focused on sharing, the intense sharing of the first century community, and how that sharing is still critical for who we are as part of our DNA as Christians, as Methodists, and so it's still important. And this week, we're going to focus on nesting, but which meaning how do we make our home in God and with each other? What does that look like? And boy, isn't that appropriate also for a time when our homes are redefined as home plus workplace plus shelter um, plus social life is all in our homes. So to focus on this kind of idea of home seems very appropriate today as well. Let me have us go into a time of prayer. I know you have so many prayers on your hearts. We're praying for each other, for each other's safety, especially as things open up and there's a little more contact in our communities. We pray for the safety of many. We pray for those who are continuing to struggle because they've lost their livelihoods and maybe their, and their very homes are threatened. We pray on this Mother's Day with joy and gratitude for our mothers and our grandmothers and our mothers in faith. We pray for our children and our grandchildren. We pray for those for whom the relationship with mothers is difficult. We pray especially for those who have lost their mothers, maybe recently, and this is the first Mother's Day without them. So let's go into this time of prayer. Um, we're joined today by David Toby rejoining us for our worship. Um, we're going to hear some music. I invite you to have prayer in your homes, in your hearts, with each other today. Let us pray.
encourage you to say out loud with me, then, the words that our Lord and Savior taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to begin today with our scriptures from 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The lectionary text actually begins with verse 4, but the, the, the first three verses of chapter 2 are so beautiful, with an image that, that about new life and being nourished by the word, that I wanted to begin with that so we understand where 1 Peter is going in this chapter. And then, as you listen, don't worry about getting, you know, kind of the, the deep theological meanings. What I want your ears to prick up for is the word stone. You will hear stone repeated throughout this passage. And Peter is just using the image of a stone and the idea of a stone and scriptural references to stone to help us understand what it means to live in and with Christ. And in fact, I encourage you to go home and read this later in your own Bibles and maybe use it as a devotional time. And notice again where the word stone appears. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 from the Common English Bible. Therefore, get rid of all ill will and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. Instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by it, you will grow into salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him as to a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans from God's perspective, it is chosen, valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus it is written in scriptures, Look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be shamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though, the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. This is a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Because they refuse to believe in the word, they stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May we be nourished and blessed by this word. Come to him, come to Jesus as to a living stone, a living stone. I, I actually think it was really important for us to hear, hear the few verses that came right before that verse 4 and that living stone where it describes that we are like babies, that we've just been born. And we are nourished by the word like receiving a mother's milk. And we are growing up into our salvation. And then right on the heels of that, First Peter says, come to him as to a living stone. Jesus, who is the living word the one who nourishes us. I actually saw in this, and maybe it's just because it was Mother's Day, but I see in this a mothering image for Jesus, the one, but think about it. Jesus births us, giving us new life. Jesus, who is the living word, nourishes us like a baby is nourished by mother's milk. It's Jesus' example and teaching that are training us up in the way we should go. And this Jesus is the living stone. How many, for how many of us, is, is some mother or mother figure somewhere, a living stone in our lives, giving us a foundation and a source of a good life for us. But this is a Jesus, come to him as a living stone. He was rejected, but in God's eyes, he's chosen and he's valuable and he's precious. 
And you know what? You are living stones. Go straight into that. You are living stones. And you're being built into a temple, into a home, into a place where God lives and we live together. We offer sacrifices. We live sacramentally. We're serving God every day in this home that's built of these living stones. These living stones. That's you. That's you. We have a home. Wherever you are, you have a home. And we're building that home together as these living stones who are nourished by Jesus, our living stone. And we know that that stone was rejected. And it goes back to Old Testament scripture and it talks about the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus is not just a living stone, but the cornerstone of our lives. This kind of foundational piece that if you take this out, like taking a piece out of a Jenga tower, eventually it will all fall down. Jesus is this cornerstone that needs to be built into this structure that we have anyways. And this idea of, of being rejected and then chosen was, was important for the first century Christians or the early second century Christians who were followers of Jesus. Because once they believed in Jesus and started following Jesus, they often could fit into the life that they had had before. They, uh, if they were Jews, that was, you know, for the Jews, Jesus' teaching was a stumbling block. Jesus, you know, it went against their strict monotheism and understanding of the law. But if they were Gentiles, they probably would have been part of the, the you know, kind of the Greek Roman pantheon of gods that was part of everyday life and social and political life. And suddenly, they didn't fit into either of those places, which meant they often lost livelihoods, were rejected socially, were split from their families, maybe had to move away and live somewhere else entirely, were actually physically persecuted. They had become socially and religiously homeless. Homeless. But God chose you, says the scripture. You may have been rejected by others, but you're chosen, and you're holy, and you're valuable, and you're precious. Not because you're necessarily, you know, you know, you're perfect or something. In fact, you know, we're not. We know we're not. You're chosen just simply because God loves you. It's God's goodness and mercy that has done this. And you now live in this place that is flooded with God's light. In fact, my image of the living stone, I don't know why this is. My image of a living stone is that it kind of glows, like with the light from within. It's almost like, you know, this living stone home looks more like it has a stained glass or translucent stones that glow from within. That's the living stone that I picture flooded with God's light. And it's so that we can tell about God's goodness and mercy that's been shown to us who didn't really deserve it. We can share that with others and let them know that they are also chosen and precious. You know, it's nesting season for birds, all kinds of birds. I'm sure you've seen them busy at it, you know, all the singing. You might, if you haven't seen, you've heard them singing, and you've seen the different pairs of birds that are so busy at this kind of year nesting. Now, I want you to think about what the building materials are for so many bird nests. Think about what they are. Fallen twigs, dead grasses, hair and fur and feathers that, that have fallen off and are no longer useful to the creatures that they came from, mud, um, even human litter gets woven into and built into these nests. So these other things that are not, were not useful or were rejected become the building blocks of these nests that will hold and shelter and be the place for new life to be born and to be nourished and to grow until it leaves the nest and builds the next nest and the next nest and the next nest. You are chosen. You are precious. You are part of God's home building and home making mission. Now keep that idea of home in mind as I read our next set of scriptures. This is from John 14, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14, from the Common English Bible. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. 
Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you all this time? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name, so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word from the Lord. Thanks be to God. In my Father's house, there's room to spare. Or maybe you grew up with, in my Father's house, there's many mansions. We always thought, and that's a good one too. Or many dwelling places, many rooms. But I like this. In my father's house, there is room to spare. I go to prepare a place for you. I will return and take you with me so that where I am, you will be also. We need to hear this. This is it. We need to hear this again. In my father's house, there's room to spare. I go to prepare a place for you. I will return and take you with me so that where I am, you will be also. You know, I know uh, when I use these words most regularly, and I am guessing that this is where you hear these words most regularly, too, and that's in, in the context of a funeral service. It's so good to, um, to know that people we love and people we honor and hold a value are being welcomed home to a place that is being prepared for them, as if Jesus is, you know, like turned on the light and change the sheets and put out clean towels and the food is ready on the table and the door is open and he's standing at the door saying welcome 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 i've been waiting for you all this time isn't that it's so good to know this in fact i love the african-american tradition of, of referring to a funeral service as a homegoing service isn't that wonderful a homegoing service but here's the one thing this this is not wrong to have this understanding of these verses but they mean so much more than that. Do you understand what Jesus is saying is, you, we do not have to wait for eternal life, life to the fullest, abundant life, the life that is promised. We do not have to wait for that life until we die. We're not sitting around going, gee, I hope that life comes soon. As soon as we say, I believe in the Son of God, Jesus the Son of God, we move in with the Father. Right away. It starts right away. This is the whole theological, Christological, eschatological meaning of the Gospel of John. The end of time is not some day we're down there and this new era has begun with Jesus' life and death and resurrection and go and ascension. It's not some days, it's, it's now. It's as soon as we choose to have this belief, we move in with God into this home, into this life, into this reality. And it's, it's so hard for us to understand that sometimes. Again, I think maybe because we don't believe in being chosen and precious. But Jesus is, is telling them this, and this is part of his, uh, his farewell discourse, they call it. This is him saying goodbye. And he's trying to explain, and I love that they don't quite get it, that both Philip and Thomas are like, yeah, not quite getting it yet. Because they're not going to get it until his work is complete. He has this job to do. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and walked among us. And Jesus performed signs and wonders to continuously, not so we could just see Jesus, but we could see God working in Jesus. And then he lays down his life to show us how God loves us and is raised again so that the Son may be glorified so that we could give glory to the Father. And he goes back to the Father, just like he promised Mary Magdalene. He said, I'm going to 
You know, my father and your father, my God and your God. He goes that way so that they will understand that this life begins now. Jesus has made it possible. Jesus has prepared the way and has shown them the truth for them to experience life, for them to experience life. And he said, you know, you maybe you should, if you can't quite believe this or get this, at least believe in what I've done so far, because here's, the, here's the, what this life is going to be like. I've done these works, you know, kind of one removed from the Father while I was living here on this earth. But once I join with the Father, you, have, you will be joined with us also. And if you ask for something in my name, you'll be able to do things also, to show signs to the Father, to let people experience this abundant life. That's following Jesus' commandments. Jesus' commandments are basically love one another and believe, or believe and love one another. And, again, we move in with God, make our home with God. And again, this would have been a, a really valuable message for those first century, second century Christians. You know, Jerusalem has fallen, and, and Jews were dispersed, and Christians were dispersed, and perse persecutions have begun, and they're making totally new lives somewhere, where they may feel like they, they don't have that connection anymore with Jesus, and he's being forgotten. And the eyewitnesses have died away. And they need to hear this message again, that the life is now. It's not just a Sunday. I know we're going through hard times now, but the life begins now. And ask for things in my name. And God is acting in and amongst you today. You are making your home with God. See me, see the Father. And he says twice, always pay attention to things that are said twice, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. So here, this gives us a different nesting image. The first Peter and the home building stuff made me think of birds nesting and building nests. But this nesting is more of a close relationship of fitting one within the other, as Jesus describes. So this is nesting more as in like nestling together, like, like a Russian nesting doll. Or, if you don't have a Russian nesting doll at your house, I'm guessing that you have common everyday things in your house, especially in your kitchen, that's where I look, in your kitchen that shows this picture of nesting, like nesting cups. Look at that. See how they all fit together? They fit together. So maybe you, I may use all of these cups in one, you know, for different things in one recipe, but then they all fit back together again. They belong. Do we not all also need to hear the message of you are loved, you belong, we fit together. We have work to do. We live within the reality of God. We are precious. We are chosen. We are at home. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, we have a special treat for you today to close our worship service. This is in honor of these scriptures, but also... Um, Reaching out to our church family and all of you, and, and for mothers, and for celebrating Mother's Day, Sarah Jankura is going to share with us, his eye is on the sparrow. <laughs>
wonderful day. Have a wonderful time living together in this home of the Lord.